Hello, linear algebra students. Today's video lesson is on the topic of matrix subspaces. Now, suppose a matrix A has dimensions m by n. So that's m rows, n columns. The null space of this matrix A is the set of all solutions to A times x is equal to the zero vector. Every single solution vector x is in the null space of A because it, when you multiply it with the matrix A, you get the null vector, the zero vector. Now, this will be a subspace of Rn, where n is the number of columns of the matrix. And it is denoted n of A or null of A. Now, one basis can be found by simply solving the system, Ax equals zero. This is called a homogeneous system because we have the zero vector as the result. And the dimension of the null space is called the nullity of A. Now we're going to use technology to find a basis for the null space of each matrix below, and we will determine the nullity of each matrix. So this first matrix is a 3 by 4 matrix, and we want to solve the following equation for all vectors x. Matrix A times vector x, and to get the zero vector. So this matrix, as we said, is 3 by 4. So if I'm going to multiply this by a vector, the vector better have four components because these two middle numbers need to match when you do matrix-matrix multiplication. And it will be a 4 by 1 vector, specifically. And that vector will have the form, well, I'll just use the x, y, z, w for the four components. But it really doesn't matter what letters you use here. You can use x1, x2, x3, x4, a, b, c, d, etc. You choose. And we want this to be equal to a zero vector. Now, how large will that zero vector be? We'll focus on the outer numbers. This should be a 3 by 1 0 vector. And this makes sense because basically what this matrix vector multiplication is doing, it's doing a linear combination of the columns of A. So x will basically be a coefficient of this first column. Y will be a coefficient of the second column, etc. And so the x, y, z, and w are really just coefficients for doing a linear combination of the columns of A. And specifically, we want them to be the coefficients that produce the zero vector out of the columns of A. Okay, and then we know how to solve such systems. We just convert it to an augmented matrix, such as this, and then put this in reduced row echelon form, such as this. And I use technology to speed that up. Now we identify that we have a total of two pivot positions here and here. And we have, uh, therefore, two columns of the coefficient matrix that do not have pivot positions, therefore we have two free variables. And let's recall that the columns corresponded to these variables. So row one translates as x minus 2y plus 2w is equal to zero. And the second row translates into z minus w is equal to zero. Now the solution that we were after was a vector x, and it has four components, x, y, z, and w. And we're going to replace the basic variables, which are x and z. They're the columns that had the pivot position and express them in terms of the free variables, which are y and w, which will stay themselves in this expression. So solving this equation right here for x and then this equation here for z, we get the following result. x has to be 2y minus 2w. y is free, so it stays itself z has to be w, and w is free, so it stays itself. At this point, I decompose this according to free variable, and then I factor out the free variable. So we're going to have a y factored out, and then write down all the coefficients of y. So we had a coefficient of y that was 2 in the first component, and then a coefficient of 1, and then no y's in the next two components. And then to this, we add w times, and then all its coefficients, which are negative 2, 0, 1, 1. So what we're claiming here is that y and w are free and that once you pick them, this linear combination of these two vectors here produce a vector that's in the null space. It'll be a vector such that when you multiply it to the matrix A, you get the zero vector back. And these two vectors are linearly independent. If we were to call them vector u and v, then we know that u and v form a linearly independent set. This is easy to determine because there's only two vectors and they are not scalar multiples of each other. So they are linearly independent. And we can say now at this point that the null space of this matrix is going to be the span of these two vectors. And since u and v were linearly independent, we know that they form a basis.
and there's only two vectors in this basis, so the dimension of this vector space is 2. And the word we use in this case is that the nullity of A is 2. Further, I want you to observe that this subspace is a subspace specifically of R4, because the vectors U and V are four-dimensional. They have four components each. And if you recall, A was a 3 by 4 matrix, and the number of columns will dictate how many components must be in a vector that's in the null space. Okay, let's look at the next example. Again, we are trying to solve b times vector x is equal to 0. So let's make sure we know what the dimensions of all these vectors are and matrices. So the matrix B is a 4 by 3. So I do need to multiply this by a 3 by 1 in order to produce a 4 by 1. The 3 by 1 is the x, y, z vector. And then we want to produce the 4-dimensional 0 vector. And once again, the x, y, z are really just going to be coefficients of these columns. We're trying to find the specific combinations of the three columns of the matrix B that will produce the zero vector. And all such vectors x, y, z that make the statement true are said to be in the null space of matrix B. Okay, so skipping straight to the augmented matrix and then to reduced row echelon form, we get the following. Okay, now that we have the reduced row echelon form of the augmented matrix, we identify the pivot positions. Notice there's one in each column that corresponds to our uh, components of our vector x. Those components are x, y, and z. Notice that each row translates directly into x has to be 0, y has to be 0, and z has to be 0. In other words, we're seeing that we have as many pivot positions as variables in the vector x, suggesting that only the 0 vector is going to be a solution. So in this case, we say that the null space of the matrix B is equal to the solitary vector, and that's the zero vector. And this is a trivial subspace. Also notice that it is a subspace of R3, and B, its dimensions were 4 by 3, and it's the number of columns that will dictate the dimension of the vectors in the null space. Remember, such a trivial vector space that has only the zero vector in it has no basis. Therefore, the dimension of the null space, in this case, we say is zero. So the nullity is zero. Now let's read uh, the bottom of this page. Note the following. The nullity of a matrix is equal to the number of pivotless columns when the matrix is in RRE form. And this should say, refer to the columns of the coefficient matrix. So columns left of the vertical line not counting the constants on the right side of the equal signs. So in this first case of matrix A, I see two columns that did not have, did not have a pivot position. Again, only looking at the coefficient matrix. And that corresponded basically to the number of free variables. And the number of free variables, once you decompose your general solution, at, like we did right here, you see will dictate ultimately how many linearly independent vectors will form the basis of the subspace. So we can know uh, just by looking at the reduced row echelon form of the augmented matrix, just count how many free variables there are going to be, and that will be the dimension of the null space. Uh, similarly, in the case of matrix B, there were no free variables. So 0 was the number of free variables here. X, Y, and Z all had pivot positions in their columns, and so the nullity is 0. Now let's take a look at this uh, next sentence. If a matrix has more columns than rows, then its nullity is more than 1. Well, think about that for a moment. If there are more variables than you have rows, then necessarily we will have some pivotless columns. So there will be some free variables. And if there are free variables, then we're going to have a non-trivial vector space, and we will have a nullity that's more than zero. And this should say zero here. So stating that again, if a matrix has more columns than rows, and remember we're talking about the matrix A, the coefficient matrix, not the augmented matrix when you tack on the zeros on the other side of the equal sign. So focus on the coefficient matrix. If a coefficient matrix has more columns than rows, then its nullity is more than zero. So we're guaranteed to have at least one uh, vector in the basis of the null space. And this third one says the columns of a matrix are linearly dependent if and only if the nullity of the matrix is not zero. So again, if it's more than zero, so the nullity is one, two, or three, that basically indicates how many free variables we have, which means that we have non-trivial solutions to the matrix times x equals zero, which ultimately means that we can find some way to express the columns in terms of the other columns.
So applying it to these two matrices A and B that we see here, since the nullity of A was not zero, it was two, it means that the columns of A are linearly dependent, that each column of the matrix A can be expressed as a linear combination of the other three columns. And in the case of the matrix B, the nullity is zero, therefore the columns of B are linearly independent. No column of the matrix B is a linear combination of the other two columns. Okay, let's go to the next page. Suppose a, a matrix has dimensions M by N, so there's the same that we've been saying before, M rows, N columns. Now the column space of a matrix A is the span of its columns. It is a subspace of RM and is denoted C of A or call of A. One basis are the columns of A that are the pivot columns of the reduced row echelon form of A. The dimension of column of A is called the rank of A. This is the same meaning of the word rank that we used earlier in this course. Uh, find a basis for the column space of each matrix below with its RRE form and determine the rank of each matrix. So we spared some time and used technology to present both the matrix and its reduced row echelon form. So let's first get oriented to what's going on here. The column space is the span of all the columns. So this matrix A has four columns. And each column, we'll call it a different vector. Column 1 is vector U1, and then U2, U3, and U4 are the four columns. It's possible that all of these vectors are collinear, in which case the span would be a line through the origin. Or maybe they're all coplanar, in which case the span of the columns would be a plane through the origin. Or maybe they... They are not collinear nor co coplanar, and they span all of R3. Let's go ahead and graph all four of these using technology. I'm using GeoGebra 3D, and I've graphed all four vectors. And from this imagery, it appears that they might all be coplanar. And furthermore, it looks like the black vector, which is U1, and the blue vector, which is U2, might be collinear. And so clearly we have a case of linear dependence amongst these vectors. If they are all coplanar, then we don't need all four of them to form a basis of the space that is their span. In fact, let me reveal the line that the black vector and blue vector are on. So we do see they are collinear. And now let me graph the plane that all these four vectors are in. So here's our plane. This is the actual column space. It's the span of these four vectors. But we don't need all four of them to make a basis. In fact, we only need, in the end, two of the four vectors. We can safely get rid of U2, because that was collinear with, with the black vector U1. And then of these three, we can keep any pair. Let's just go ahead and keep the black and the green, and I'll get rid of U4. Basically, the two vectors that are left will form a basis. Two vectors that are linearly independent, and they span the entire space still. All right, looking back at our notes, we can actually answer this question of which of these vectors we need to keep to form a basis by putting the matrix A in reduced row echelon form, identifying where the pivot positions are, and the pivots are in columns 1 and 3. Therefore, we can keep columns 1 and 3 of the matrix A to form a basis of the column space. These weren't the only choices. I could have kept 1 and 4, or 3 and 4, but the reduced row echelon form will reliably tell us which columns we ought to keep to form the basis. So the column space of this matrix A will be equal to the span of the first column, we're calling U1, and the third column, which we're calling vector U3. And notice this will be a subspace of R3. And in this case, A it was a 3 by 4 matrix, and it's the number of rows that will dictate the dimension of the subspace that is its column space. That should make intuitive sense to you. Well, because A has three rows, each column has three components. And if we do linear combinations of three-dimensional vectors, we will only get a collection of three-dimensional vectors. And then we can now say that the dimension of this space, also called the rank, is equal to the number of vectors in the basis, and that's going to be two. Now, before we first talked about rank, we defined it simply as the number of pivot positions when the matrix was in reduced row echelon form. And you can see how that uh, doesn't contradict what we're now seeing about rank. Okay, looking at matrix B, matrix B has columns that are in four space, so I won't be able to graph it to make sense of what's happening, but you get the idea. We have uh, three columns of the matrix B, and we're curious if all three are needed to form a basis, or maybe only uh, two of them are required to form a basis, or maybe just one. Well, the way to answer this is to put matrix B in reduced row echelon form and focus on where the pivot positions are. There are in all three columns, 
So we have pivots in columns 1, 2, and 3. Therefore, columns 1, 2, and 3 of the matrix B are all required to form a basis for the column space of B. So in this case here, the column space of B will be equal to the span of all the columns of B. Let's refer to these as vector 1, vector 2, and vector 3. So I can write here vector 1, vector 2, and vector 3. Span them to get the entire column space. It also suggests to us that these three are already linearly independent. Therefore, we have a linearly independent, we have a basis. It's sort of redundant to say linearly independent basis, because to be a basis, you have to be linearly independent. So just calling it a basis suggests they are, li they are linearly independent, and they also span the entire space. Also notice that this is going to be a subspace of R4, because B was a 4 by 3 matrix, and it's the number of rows that dictate the uh, dimension of the vectors that are the linear combinations of the columns, because each column has four components. And in this case, the rank of this matrix, therefore, is 3, because we have three vectors in its basis. Okay, reading at the bottom of this page, note the following. The rank of a matrix is the number of pivot positions when that matrix is in RRE form. Right, that's something that we had already discussed in a previous lecture, so we're just connecting the definition of rank here as the dimension of a column space to a previous definition of rank. Also notice the rank and the nullity of a matrix should add to the number of columns of the matrix. Right, in the previous slide, we discussed that it's the number of pivotless columns that will be the nullity, and we can see two pivotless columns, and the number of uh, columns with a pivot position will be equal to the rank, and this should account for all the columns with, without any overlap. Either the column will have a pivot position or it will not. Therefore, in this case here for the matrix A, the nullity is going to be 2 because there are two purple vectors there, and the rank will also be 2 because we have uh, two columns with pivot positions, and this accounts for all four columns, and the rank and the nullity do add to four. And in the case of matrix B, the nullity was zero, and the rank is three, and zero and three do add to the number of columns. And look at that last sentence now. If the rank is equal to the number of columns, then the columns of the matrix are linearly independent. So looking at matrix A, the, num the rank is two, the number of columns is four, and two is less than four, which suggests we only needed these two vectors to make our basis, suggesting the other two vectors are linear combinations of the two pink vectors. So this forms a linearly dependent set because the rank was less than the number of columns. Whereas in matrix B, the rank is 3, and that's equal to the number of columns. Therefore, all three columns of matrix B are linearly independent, thereby forming a basis for the column space. Now, for the matrix B, we cannot then tap into the equivalence theorem that we've been talking about because matrix B is not a square matrix. We'll talk more about that at the end of this lecture. Let's go to the next page. Again, we have a matrix that has dimensions m by n. Now, the row space of a matrix A is the span of its rows, and this will be a subspace of Rn and is denoted R of A or rho of A. So now we have to think sideways. Think of each row as a vector. So you see matrix A represents three row vectors, and the row vectors are four-dimensional. And if we do all linear combinations of these four-dimensional vectors, we get something called the row space. One basis for the row space of A are the non-zero rows of the reduced row echelon form of the matrix A. And then the dimension of the row of A is the same as the dimension of the column of A, which we call the rank of A. So the dimension of the row space and the dimension of the column space will always be, be the same, so we could say rank for both. Now find a basis for the row space of each matrix below with its RRE form and determine each dimension. So again, saving time, each matrix has been put into reduced row echelon form for us. And once you do that, you actually just keep the non-zero rows of the reduced row echelon form. So this row right here is, no, is non-zero, and this row right here is non-zero, meaning that there is at least one non-zero entry in it. And we are going to call these two uh, vectors uh, u1 and u2. They are four-dimensional vectors. The row space, in this case, of A will be equal to the span of these two vectors. And I'm going to reorient them back into column vectors. So U1 is 1, negative 2, 0, 2. And U2 is 0, 0, 1, negative 1. So it is the span of these two four-dimensional vectors that form the row space. So all linear combinations of them. And this is a subset of R4. Keep in mind A is 3 by 4. 
and it's the number of columns of A that will dictate the dimension of the vectors that are in the row space. And then we don't have a separate word for row space, but we can just say DIM, meaning dimension. So the dimension of the row space of this matrix will be equal to the number of vectors in its basis, which is two vectors. And this is the same thing as the rank of the matrix A that we saw earlier. And the reason that is, is because the rank is how many pivot columns there are, but every pivot column will correspond directly to a non-zero row. So the number of pivot columns always equals the number of non-zero rows in the reduced row echelon form. That's why we always are guaranteed to have that the rank and the uh, dimension of the row space are the same. So we can just call them both rank. Okay, let's look at matrix B. Matrix B has three non-zero rows in it. We'll call them vector 1, vector 2, and vector 3. So the row space of B will be equal to the span of these three vectors. And you'll notice that when you uh, orient them vertically again, we're really just looking at the standard basis vectors in this case. So uh, vector 1 is really just the i vector, vector 2 is the j vector, and vector 3 is the k vector. And when you span the standard basis vectors, you're going to get all of R3 in this case, which is trivially a subset of R3. B was, or B is, 4 by 3, and the number of columns of B dictates the dimension of any vector that's in its row space. And the dimension of the row space of B is simply the same thing as the dimension of the column space of B, which should be 3 in both cases. So we get 3, which is also called the rank. Okay, note the following at the bottom of the page. The row space of a matrix can be thought of instead as the column space of its transpose. Right? If you do the linear combinations of the rows of the matrix A, then if you do the transpose, the rows become the columns. So the span of the columns of A transpose will naturally be equal to the span of the rows of the original matrix A. Furthermore, if B is a matrix obtained from A, and this B is not referring to the B in our notes here, but just in general, if B is a matrix that is obtained from A via any sequence of row operations, then the row space of B will be equal to the row space of A. This is one reason we can find a basis for the row space by putting the matrix A in a reduced row echelon form, because as you do row operations on A, you don't actually change the row space, because row operations just do basically linear combinations of its rows. And if you take a bunch of vectors that are in a subspace and do linear combinations of them, you still have vectors in that space, because a space by definition is closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition. So the third sentence, the row space of A, which is also the column space of A transpose, but let's focus right now, let's say it this way, that the row space of A and the null space of A are both subspaces of, of Rn, where n was the number of columns, and they turns out that they are orthogonal spaces to each other, meaning that if you take any vector from the row space and then take any vector from the null space, they will be orthogonal, meaning that they'll be perpendicular in 2 and 3D contexts, and their dot product will be zero, or their inner product will be zero in all other contexts, like four-dimensional and higher. Uh, if two vectors are orthogonal, if you recall, it means that their inner product is zero. So any vector from the row space of A is orthogonal to any vector from the null space of A. Now we'll talk more about this relationship as its own slide a little bit later in this lecture. But let's go to the next page. All right, here's one more uh, subspace of a matrix that isn't often talked about, but we'll take a moment to discuss it. Again, a matrix A has dimensions m by n. The left null space of a matrix A is the set of all solutions to A transpose x equals 0. And it is a subspace of Rm and is denoted n of A transpose or null of A transpose. So the left null space of a matrix is really just the same thing as the null space of its transpose. Therefore, to find a basis for the left null space of a matrix A, we just really need to find a basis for the null space of its transpose. So all the work you see here is work that we have already done. But instead, we'll take the transpose of the matrix, multiply it by some vector x, and get the zero vector, and basically solve this for all vectors x. So writing A transpose, the rows of A become the columns of A transpose. So the first row becomes the first column, etc. And here we have A transpose. Now we need to, well, A is a 3 by 4 matrix. Therefore, a transpose is a 4 by 3 matrix, and we need to multiply this by a 3 by 1 vector x in order to get a 4 by 1 0 vector. So vector x has to be three components, x, y, z. These will be the coefficients, basically, of each column of, the, of a transpose, and set this equal to the four-dimensional 0 vector.
Now putting this into an as an augmented matrix and then putting it in reduced row echelon form, we get the following. Okay, and the pivot positions are here and here. There's only two pivot positions. Keep in mind that we had x, y, z as our variables of the vector x. z is free and x and y are basic. So we can see that x plus 2z is 0, so x has to be negative 2z. y plus z is 0, so y has to be negative z, and z is free. So our solution only in terms of the free variables would be negative 2z, negative z, and z. And then, of course, we can factor the z out, and we can see a basis vector emerge. So the null space of the transpose of A, which we're calling the left null space of the matrix A, is equal to the span of this one vector. Notice it is a subspace of R3, and R3 ultimately, if we track it back, was the number of rows of the matrix A. And the dimension of this space, therefore, is only equal to 1, because we had one vector in its basis. We had one free variable. Doing similarly over here, we want to solve B transpose vector x equals 0 vector. So here's the transpose of the matrix B. Now B was uh, 4 by 3, so its transpose is 3 by 4. We need to multiply this by a 4 by 1 uh, vector x in order to get a 3 by 1 0 vector. So we need to have uh, x, y, z, and w will be the components of our vector x, and then this will be equal to the 0 vector. That is three-dimensional. Converting this to an augmented matrix and then putting it in reduced row echelon form, we get the following. So we have three pivot positions. So x, y, and z are all basic, but w is free. Expressing each basic variable in terms of w, we get that x has to be 2w, y has to be negative 5w, z has to be 4w, and if w is free. And therefore, we can express our, all of our answers as any multiple of the basis vector to negative 5, 4, 1. Therefore, the null space of B transpose, which is what we're calling the left null space of, the, of matrix B, is equal to the span of this one vector. And this will be a subset of our 4 because all the vectors in it will have four components. This, this number 4 matches the ultimately the number of rows of the matrix B. And the dimension of this space is equal to 1 because there was one vector in its basis. This is a one-dimensional subspace, but existing in four-dimensional space. Even though this is one-dimensional space, every vector is four-dimensional, has four components. So don't get those conflated. The dimension of the vector is four, but the dimension of the span of that vector is one. Because we define the dimension of a vector space in a different way than we define the dimension of a vector. And note the following. The column space of A and the null space of A transpose are both subspaces of, of Rm and are orthogonal spaces to each other. This is basically a repeat of the sentence that we have right here, but I swap the position of the A and the A transpose. We will explore at a later slide the orthogonal relationship between the row space of a matrix and its null space. Okay, in this slide, here we explore the relationships that one relationship is that the row space of a matrix A is equal to the column space of its transpose, and therefore the row space of a transpose is equal to the column space of A. So use the techniques discussed earlier to find a basis for the row and column spaces of A and A transpose, with their RRE forms presented below as well, and uh, compare the results. Focusing on A, A is a square matrix, 3 by 3, but I put matrix A in reduced row echelon form, and we see that it has two pivot positions, and the pivot positions are in columns 1 and 2. Therefore, columns 1 and 2 of the original matrix can be used as a basis for the column space of this matrix, meaning that we don't need that third column to form the basis. It's all three of these vectors in matrix A are coplanar. We just need the first two of them to make a basis. So the column space of A is equal to the span of the first two columns of the matrix A. And the row space is found by keeping the non-zero rows of the reduced row echelon form. So we actually get to use these two vectors, reorient them, and we say that the row space of A is equal to the span of those two vectors reoriented, so 1, 0, 7, and 0, 1, negative 2. Okay, now let's do the same thing but for the uh, A transpose. The column space of A transpose is equal to the span. Well, A transpose has pivots in columns 1 and 2 again, so I just keep the first two columns of A transpose as a basis for its column space. So that's vector 1, 2, 3, and vector 0, negative 1, 2. Whereas a basis for the row space of A transpose will be the non-zero rows of the reduced row echelon form of A transpose. So we get the span of vector 1, 0, negative 1, and 0, 1, 1. 
Okay, now the relationships make the following claims, which make good intuitive sense, but that the column space of A should be equal to the row space of its transpose, and that the row space of A should be equal to the column space of its transpose. Well, if that were true, notice that the bases that are being used for these spaces are not equal. So it does raise some questions about, well, are these in fact the same spaces? We're not using the same bases. And we're going to use some technology to confirm that these in fact the two red spaces are the same and that the two orange spaces are the same. So I'm going to graph these two vectors here that we're using as a basis for column space of A. And then notice over here, uh, one vector has been repeated, but we do have another vector uh, acting as a basis vector. So I'm going to graph the three vectors that are all different. So in GeoGebra 3D, the, those three vectors in question are all graphed here. They're all in red, and they all do appear to be coplanar. I'm going to graph that plane. And so the first method for finding the space, which was the column space of the matrix A, was the span of 1, 0, negative 1, that's the one I'm calling A1, and 2, negative 1, negative 3, the one I'm calling A2 here. So we didn't include this vector in that, but you can see that these two vectors are linearly independent, and they are in the plane, therefore their span will make this same plane. But when I use the other technique of finding the row space of A transpose, I had two different vectors in my vector space, the ones that I'm calling... Uh, A1 and A3. But even though these are different basis vectors, they sp still span the same space. So as far as the plane is concerned, it's the same plane, so it doesn't really matter which basis I use. They both, in the end, describe the same plane. Now looking at the uh, two orange spaces in our notes, for the row space of A, we had 1, 0, 7 and 0, 1, negative 2. That's these two vectors here. The span of those two vectors is this plane, but the column space of A transpose also used uh, 0, 1, negative 2 in its basis, but did not use B1. It used this thing I'm calling B3, but notice that's also in the plane. And so once again, it doesn't matter which pairing I use, uh, B2, B3 in this notation, or B1, B2, they both span the same plane. So what we're seeing on this uh, page in our notes then is that you really have some options. If you want to find a column space of a matrix, you can use the method for finding column spaces, or you can instead find the row space of its transpose and use the method for finding row spaces. You just have some options. Okay, the next page. Here's where we explore the claim that the null space and row space of a matrix A with dimensions n by n are orthogonal subspaces of Rn. Consider the matrix below with its RRE form. Okay, let's first uh, find the, uh, the null space. The null space is where I would have augmented this with a zero vector. So there would be a zero vector here augmented. And we would have uh, vectors x, y, z. And we're trying to find all vectors x, y, z that uh, when you multiply to the matrix A, you get the zero vector back. Notice that we have a free variable. There's only two pivot positions, so z is a free variable. So this gives us that uh, x has to be equal to 7z, and y has to be equal to 3z, and z is free. So this gives us all multiples of the vector 7, 3, 1. And so in this case here, we have that the null space of the matrix A is equal to the span of this one vector. Well, that's going to be a line in 3 space that goes through the origin. We'll graph it in a moment. Now to find the row space of the matrix A, we need to span the two non-zero rows of the reduced row echelon form of that matrix. So that would be this row and this row, right? Don't include the augmented part when you're doing the row space. So it's the span of the vectors 1, 0, negative 7, and 0, 1, negative 3. Let's call this first vector, that's the basis of the null space, vector u, and we'll make it green in our image. And the first vector in the span of the row space we'll call vector v in red and vector w in blue. So this is going to be difficult to draw in a two-dimensional context, but u would be 7 in the x direction, 3 in the y direction, up and 1 in the, y, in the z direction, so some sort of vector like this. We'll do this in 3D here in a moment. The red vector, zero, 1, 0, 7, so 1 in the x direction, nothing in the y direction, down 7, so it would be some vector pointing down here in the x, z plane. And the vector w is nothing in the x direction, 1 in the y direction, and then down 3 in the z direction. It's going to be some vector like this that's in the yz plane. So now imagine the plane that the 
red and the blue vector is in, and this plane is the row space. And now imagine the span of the green vector, that's going to be a line through the origin, something like this, and this line here represents the null space. So if you were managed, if you could rotate this and look at the plane straight from the edge, something like this, in such a way that you could see the vector uh, v and the vector u being coplanar, then we would expect to see the line that is the null space of a be perpendicular. Any vector that terminates on the line will be perpendicular to any vector that terminates on the plane because the line and plane are perpendicular to each other. We can prove this statement. For example, pick any vector vector a that's in the uh, null space. That would be uh, any vector that's on the green line there. This would imply that a, therefore, is some multiple of its basis vector. So a is equal to some multiple of this vector u. And if we take another vector that's in the row space, therefore it would be a linear combination of v and w. So b would be equal to some scalar t times vector v plus some scalar s times vector w. And then if I do the dot product of these, we do expect to get zero because uh, we're claiming that the vectors are orthogonal, vector, vectors a and b. They're perpendicular to each other. They should have a zero dot product. But let's go ahead and confirm that. I'll be dot producting uh, k times u, dot product it with uh, t times vector v plus s times vector w. And the dot product distributes. The k-lers can be pulled to the front of each dot product. So we basically get k times t times the dot product of u and v plus k times s times the dot product of u and w. We'll just go back up to these basis vectors and do their dot products. I right, do the dot product of u and v. So you would do a 7 times 1 plus 3 times 0 plus 1 times negative 7. And the dot product does give us 0. Furthermore, uh, the dot product of u and w, we get 7 times 0 is 0. 3 times 1 is 3. And 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. And those also add to 0. So the u dot product v and u dot product w are 0 in each case. And so we really just get kt, whatever those scalars are, times 0 plus ks, whatever those scalars are, times 0, and we just get 0 out of all this, suggesting that a and b are perpendicular to each other, which, in other words, we can say a and b are orthogonal. Now, this should make sense, because if you take any vector in the null space, such as 7, 3, 1, and you multiply it to the matrix A, we get the 0 vector. Well, if you imagine, here's the matrix A again, Multiply it by a vector that's in the null space, like the 7, 3, 1. And when you do matrix vector multiplication, the 7, 3, 1 goes here, drops down onto the rows, multiplies, adds the results. So in other words, it's doing a dot product with this first row. And it, you get 0. And then you dot product with this row, you get 0. Dot product with this row, you get 0. Dot product with this row, you get 0. The reason we know this is because 7, 3, 1 was in the null space. It makes the 0 vector. So when you dot product the 7, 3, 1 with each of the rows, you get 0 every time. So if a vector is perpendicular to all the rows of a matrix, then it will certainly be perpendicular to any linear combination of the rows. Therefore, it will be perpendicular to the entire row space, basically. Using GeoGebra 3D to see this using some 3D software, the red and blue vectors form the basis of the row space, and I will reveal now that plane. And then the green vector is a basis for the null space. Its span is this line. And sure enough, we can see that the line and plane are perpendicular to each other. OK, and let's go now to the last page. At this point, we can expand and restate the equivalence theorem for square matrices. So suppose A is a square matrix with dimensions n by n then the following statements are all equivalent, meaning they are either all true together or all false together. Furthermore, all the statements apply to A transpose as well, because if A is square and invertible, then A transpose is also invertible. We now have 11 statements in our theorem. Many of them are repeats of what we've seen in the past, so we're just expanding the collection. And some are maybe restated in slightly different ways and reordered. But here are the statements. The first statement, the matrix A is invertible, meaning non-singular. So if one is true, then the matrix A is a product of elementary matrices. Its determinant will be non-zero. It will reduce to the identity matrix. The system AX equals zero has only the trivial solution. That means that the null space of this 
matrix is just the zero vector. Well, the rank of A will be N, because if A reduces to the identity matrix, it has ones, has pivot positions in all the columns, so the rank will be N. The nullity will be zero, because the null space is just the zero vector. Uh, the system AX equals B is always consistent and has the unique solution X equals A inverse times B. The columns of A are linearly independent, and they span all of Rn. Thus, they form a basis for Rn. And the rows of A are also linearly independent, and they span Rn, thus they form a basis for Rn. So looking at this 3x3 three three matrix, let's just discuss some of these. We have a 3x3 three three matrix. Let's do statement number uh, 3. Statement number 3, let's calculate the determinant of this, and I'll use technology to do that. The determinant of this 3x3 three three matrix will be negative 1. That's non-zero. So statement 3 is true, which means all 11 statements are true. So I've copied the matrix A, so I'm going to analyze it from a different angles. The columns of A form a basis for R3, so they will span all of R3. And by definition of a basis, they're also all independent of each other. But also it's true that the rows, if you think of them as vectors, are also independent. And they also form a basis for R3. They will span all of R3. We know that A uh, reduces to the identity, in this case I3, which has ones on the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. Which means if you were to do a, an augmented matrix with a zero vector, it would certainly reduce to the identity matrix equal sign zeros. Which means that the only solution is the trivial solution. So we do get that the uh, null space of the matrix is just equal to only the zero vector. So its nullity is zero. But its rank is the number of pivots in its reduced row echelon form. So if it does reduce to the identity matrix, that means it has three pivots. So its rank is going to be three. And remember that the nullity plus the rank should always equal the number of columns. So if the nullity goes uh, more than zero, then that will force the rank to drop less than three. And we will that would only correspond to a square matrix that is not invertible, that has a zero determinant or the columns are linearly dependent, the rows are linear, linearly dependent. So basically, once any one of these statements goes false, uh, they all go false. Okay, and this wraps up our discussion on matrix subspaces.